Thank you for joining me today. My name is Shelby Kearley, and today I'm going to be discussing international naming conventions. When you think of a name, what do these names say to you? Bobby Sue Taylor, Reggie White, Salvatore Sal Falco, Basil Thibodeau, Miguel Garcia Arias, Floyd and Iris Miller, Olga Johansson, David Levi Solomon, Clayton Endicott III, Mohammed Shirazi. Each one of these names says something to whoever sees this name, whoever reads this name. Um, in some cases, you can tell, like from Floyd and Iris Miller, that's obviously a couple. Hopefully it's a married couple, in my assumption. Um, in some cases, the names may sound not U.S., uh, such as Basil Thibodeau, Miguel Ari Garcia Arias, Mohammed Shirazi. Um, some names you can tell that are nicknames, like such as Salvatore Sal Falco. Some names may indicate religious connotation, may indicate status connotation. So when you think of names, there are associations um, with each name. They can sometimes tell you the gender, family, social status, generation, uh, region or area, religion or spirituality, heritage and race, wealth and status, occupation and caste. So why is it important for us to understand what naming conventions are like around the world? It helps us as international educators be able to match up a student's record um, in our databases with the documentation that we receive. In some cases, students' names appear vastly different um, on legal documents th than they do um, on their academic credentials, than they will on their test scores. So it's possible that you can have multiple database entries for a single person without realizing that you've made this error. So before we begin discussing naming conventions, it's important for us to actually have a primer on languages. And we're gonna start by talking about transcription versus translation. This is literally translating from one writing to another. Transcription is more of a phonetic interpretation, while transliteration represents the letters exactly. So why is it that we concentrate on transcription rather than transliteration? Primarily for three reasons. Number one, some English vowel sounds don't exist in other languages, and the vice versa is also true. Some English consonant sounds don't exist in the other language, and vice versa is also true. And then some languages are not written with letters. What issues are related to transcription and transliteration? Well, there is a lack of consistent rules from some languages or varying sets of rules. Uh, there is country variation in the choice of rules, country and or regional variations in pronunciation. The same name may be transcribed differently, even within the same family. And it's also more confusing when common or religious names cross over several countries with different scripts. And the, the most popular example of this name uh, issue is with the name Muhammad, which we'll discuss later. So first we're gonna talk about the use of Arabic script. The dark green countries in this map represent those countries where Arabic is the official language. Lighter green represents those countries in which Arabic is either one of several official languages or is a language of everyday use. So some of the countries that are represented here in the Middle East and Central Asia include uh, the languages of Turkish and Kirk Turkmen, Kurdish and Turkmen, I'm sorry, in Iraq, Farsi and Baluchi in Iran, Dari, Pashto, and Uzbek in Afghanistan, Uyghur, Kazakh, and Kyrgyz in Northwest China. In South Asia, this includes Urdu, Punjabi, Sindhi, Kashmiri, and Baluchi in Pakistan, and it also includes Urdu and Kashmiri in India. In Southeast Asia, it includes Malay in Burma, and it's also used for religious purposes in Malaysia, Indonesia, parts of Thailand, Singapore, and the Philippines. In Africa, it, this includes the languages of Badawi and Beja in the Sudan, Hausa in Nigeria, and Tamazite and other Berber languages. Now a little bit about Arabic script. As we mentioned before, the name Muhammad. The name Muhammad is an excellent example of difficulty in transliteration transcription. This name is literally written as MHMD. However, the vowels and the pronunciation depend upon the region. D 
and T are interchangeable depending on the region. And in some cases, the middle M is repeated when it's transcribed. So there are several variations of the name Mohammed. And some of these include Mehmed, Mohammed, Mahmed, Mahmud, Muhammad, Mohammed, and Mohammed. Another example that I like to use when teaching uh, new hires and, and new faculty staff about um, naming conventions is the name of the former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi. Now, I'm specifically going to be talking about the name Gaddafi, um, but this could also apply to his first name, Muammar, as well. Um, variations of his name include the following Q A D D I F, uh, Q A D D A F I, Q A T A F I. K-A-D-A-F-I, K-A-D-D-A-F-I, K-H-A-D-D-A-F-I, and so on and so forth. Also, any one of those names could have been preceded by A-L dash or by A-L space. So Al-Qaddafi, Al-Qaddafi, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see how it might be confusing to try to match up information when it has one name with a, an application in your database or a record in CVS with a different name. Next we're going to talk about Cyrillic script. Dark green represents where Cyrillic script is the script of the official language. Light green represents where the script is one of multiple uh, official scripts. So this is going to include the East Slavic languages of Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian, and Rusin, South Slavic languages of Bulgarian, Serbian, Macedonian, Montenegrin, and Bosnian, West Slavic language of Polish, the Uralic languages of Karelian, Kildin, Sami, Komi, Permiak, and Mari, Iranian languages of Kurdish, Ossetian, and Tajik, Romance languages including Moldovan, Romanian, Ladino, and Romani, Mongolian languages of Kalka, Buryat, and Kalmyk, Caucasian languages of Ab uh, Abkhaz, uh, Avar, and Lesgian, Turkic languages of Azerbaijani and Bashkir, Chuvash, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Tatar, Turkmen, and Uzbek. And then there are a few others, including Dungan in China, Tunguskic, Chukoto, Kamchatkan, and Eskimo Alouette languages. And these are seen in parts of Russia, um, Canada, and Alaska. The Cyrillic script, uh, the Cyrillic alphabet, is actually a family of alphabets and subsets of which are primarily used in Slavic languages. Not all letters are used in every language in which Cyrillic script is used. Then you have common spelling variations, um, and these occur in names with the following sounds or letters. Y, J, and I are interchangeable. G, H, G, or H, and the combination Z, H, and the letter J. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, some countries transitioned to the Latin alphabet um, instead of using the Cyrillic script. These include uh, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan. In other countries, the Cyrillic alphabet is written both in the Cyrillic script and in the Latin alphabet, and these countries include Serbia, Croatia, Bulgaria, Belarus, and Bosnia. Next, we're going to discuss uh, the use of Chinese characters. Uh, the countries in orange um, represent countries where currently they solely use simplified Chinese characters. The red countries include uh, countries who solely use traditional Chinese characters. Yellow indicates the current use of Chinese characters alongside another writing system or systems, and green countries indicate uh, there was a historical use of Chinese characters, but they may now be restricted to just artistic and decorative works or to linguistic studies. Uh, there is no single Chinese alphabet. Instead, the major Chinese languages, Mandarin and Cantonese, are based on images and syllables, which are known as monosyllabic lo logograms uh, or logograms, rather than individual letters. Pinyin is the transcription type that is used in mainland China, uh, while Wade Giles' uh, transcription style is used in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. Uh, the Japanese language um, is expressed through characters and uses more than one writing system. Uh, the first we'll discuss is kanji, and this is the use of Chinese characters. Hiragana. 
Um, and this is Japanese writing form used when kanji characters don't exist. They tend to be curvy letters. And finally, we have katakana. This is used to write foreign names and words and the names of other countries. These are sharper and more square-like characters. Um, and since this is the style of, of uh, writing that is used to express foreign names, I always like to know what my name looks like in another language. And so this is what my name, Shelby, looks like in katakana. Um, any name may have several written forms, and a name written in kanji, <clears throat> excuse me, may have more than one common pronunciation. So now that we've had a little bit of a primer um, on languages and writing styles, we're going to move now into the naming conventions. Before we begin, I'd like to provide some definitions to give you some context. Um, throughout the rest of the presentation, when we use the phrase given name, this stands for the personal name or the name that a person calls oneself. And we also call this the first name or Christian name. The second name is typically what we refer to as the middle name in the United States. And finally, surname stands for the family name or the name that's typically associated with the family. But this can vary country by country. And we also call this the last name. So now we're going to move on to US and European naming standards. In this example, the, the name Charlotte Elizabeth Edwards. Charlotte is the given name. Elizabeth is the second name. And Edwards is the surname. In the United States and in most of Europe, um, second name or second names are much more common. Um, upon marriage, a woman typically takes her husband's family name. However, this is not always the case. Um, in parts of the United States and, and most of Europe, um, some women may drop the maiden name and replace that with her husband's surname. So in the example above, Charlotte Elizabeth Edwards marries Nicholas Bryant. Her new name will be Charlotte Elizabeth Bryant. However, some women drop the second name and use their maiden name as the, the second name. Um, so Charlotte Elizabeth Edwards marrying Nicholas Bryant, her new name would become Charlotte Edwards Bryant. Um, this is what my mother did when she married. She was born Patricia K. Elder, and when she married my father, she changed her name legally to Patricia Elder Kearley. Um, then there are some women who choose to keep their maiden name, or they choose to hyphenate the maiden name in married surnames. So in the first example, Charlotte Edwards marries Nicholas Bryant. Her name would remain Charlotte Edwards, or um, should she choose to hyphenate that name, it would be Charlotte Edwards-Bryant. In Eastern Europe and Russia, women take their husband's surname, but it carries a feminine ending. For example, Trotsky becomes Trotskya or Trotskaya, uh, Davidov becomes Davidova. Um, and we're going to discuss more specifics on Russian and Polish surnames later in today's presentation. Next, we're moving on to Hispanic naming. Um, in this example, Juan Pedro Alvarez Reyes, Juan is the given name, Pedro is the second name, Alvarez is the father's surname, and Reyes is the mother's surname. Hispanic names consist of both paternal and maternal surnames. Children will retain the parental surnames from both parents legally, although they may only use their father's surname in everyday use. So it is possible that you could receive documents for uh, Juan Alvarez Reyes or Juan, Reye uh, Juan Alvarez. Um, so you need to be aware that this is possible. Given names may be one to three names long. So in this example above, Juan may be the first name and Pedro may be the second name, but his name could also appear with Juan Pedro as the given name with no second name. Um, another possibility is that his given name could be Juan Pedro and his second name could be another name like Juan Pedro Miguel Alvarez Reyes. Hispanic women do not commonly change their surnames after marriage, although you do sometimes see this. Um, and also, it's usually easy to determine gender based on given names. Typically, only the male names will end with the letter O, while female names with, uh, will end with an A. This is not so in every case. However, a perfect example is our newest employee hired uh, at Texas Tech University Graduate School. Um, her first name is Mayo. Um, She's obviously a female, but this is this was the name that her parents decided to give her. So it kind of threw us off when we met her in person. We were expecting a male, uh, but she was a female. Also, the suffix 
EZ in a Hispanic name means son of. So Martinez means Martin's son, while Rodriguez means Rodrigo's son. Now we're going to be moving on to Brazil and Portuguese naming. In this example, Diego Rogério do Nascimento Cripaldi. Diego is the given name, Rogério is the second name, do Nascimento is the mother's surname, Cripaldi is the father's surname. So it does like Hispanic naming consist of both paternal and maternal surnames, but they're in a different order. The mother's name comes first, then followed by the father's surname. Um, it is possible to see the preposition de, del, de la, or do prior to the father's surname. Um, however, Brazilian and Portuguese students tend to Americanize their name. Um, and so for the example above, his Americanized name would be Diego Cropoli because they go with their given name and their father's surname. Next, we're moving on to Filipino naming. In this example, Aveline Elizaide Bella Rose. Aveline is the given name. Elizaide is the second name. Bella Rose is the surname. There are Hispanic influences for many names in the Philippines, but uh, Filipino naming conventions do not follow Hispanic naming conventions by and large. Um, the second name is the mother's surname, and this is this is in nine out of ten cases. Um, upon marriage, the woman uh, will change her name. Um, the father's surname becomes her second name, while her husband's surname becomes her surname. So in the example above, Aveline Elizaide Bella Rose marries Alexander Breckenridge. Her name then becomes Aveline Bella Rose Breckenridge. Now we're moving on to Chinese naming. Um, in this example, the name Chen Lin, Chen represents the surname, Lin represents the given name. So like many East Asian countries, the name order is reversed from the U.S. convention. Surnames are typically only one syllable long. The most common surnames in China are Li, Wang, and Zhang. Um, given names tend to be gender neutral. Um, it's very difficult to tell from just looking at a name without having a picture or like a copy of their passport to look at. It's very difficult for you to be able to determine gender based solely on the name. Very rarely, a generation name is added between the surname and the given name. A generation name is one name given to all siblings and cousins of the same sex in a particular family to distinguish the generation from their parents' generation. So if the person in, in this example had a generation name, the name would be uh, Chen King Lin, where Chen would represent the surname, King the generation name, and Lin the given name. Um, just a caveat, I have not seen a generation name for a Chinese student in more than 12 years of working with Chinese applicants. So this is very rare in, in my experience. Women will retain their surnames after marriage, although some may choose to add the husband's surname before her own name. So for example, if this person uh, in our example is a female, Chen Lin marries Zhang Xiaoping. Her name could now either remain Chen Lin, which is the most common, or she could now be Chang Jen Lin. Their children's surname would be the father's surname of Chang. Now we're moving on to Korean naming. And in this sample, uh, it, it could be said either one of two ways, Lee Chang Sun or Lee Chang Sun Su. Korean names consist of a surname and a given name. For older generations, there may be an optional generational name. Unlike China, it will appear after the given name. So in this example, if this person were using a, a generational name, the name would be Li Chang Sun Su, where Li is the surname, Chang Sun is the given name, Su is the optional generational name. This is not common. Um, regarding surnames, there are only about 250 surnames in use in Korea. Almost 50% of Koreans have the surname of Park, Kim, or Lee. The names Lee, L-E-E, -E, and Yi, Y-I, are the same written out in Korean. Given names are generally two names. They may be hyphenated, like in the example above, chang dash sun um, or they may be combined, Chang Sun, all one word, or they may have a space between them, Chang space Sun. 
Two given names represent the given name, and the person should be called by that two-name combination. Upon marriage, women will retain their surnames, and they do not take the names of their husband. <coughs> Excuse me. Japanese naming. In this example, Tanaka Kazuko. Tanaka represents the surname. Kazuko represents the given name. So the surname is first, followed by the given name. There is no second name. Um, in Japan, there are as many as 100,000 surnames, and their usage varies by region. Most names are written in kanji style with a variety of possible pronunciations. Um, both given names and surnames consist of two kanji symbols each, and the Japanese government regulates names written in kanji, and only kanji which appears on the government list of approximately 2,230 uh, may be used in given names. Given names are not generally gender specific, but the name ending may help you determine the gender. Um, male names will typically end with O, Ro, She, or Yo. Female names typically end with E, Ko, Mi, or Yo. Um, upon marriage, women do not take their husband's surname. Now we move on to Vietnamese uh, naming conventions. Um, in this example, it will either be Pham Ho or Pham Ti Ho, where Pham is the surname, T is the optional middle name, and Ho represents the given name. Um, Vietnamese naming conventions, their names are written exactly backwards of Western naming conventions. So instead of uh, given name, second name, surname, in Vietnamese, it's surname, optional, second name, given name. There are approximately 300 surnames in Vietnam, the most common of which is Nguyen, N-G-U-Y-E-N. -E Other popular surnames include Tron, Le, Vu, Nguyen, Pham, No, Trung, Dun, Trinh, Dang, Bui, Lam. Um, the middle name is optional, but when it's used, it may help you to determine a person's gender. Um, because many uh, Vietnamese given names are not gender specific. However, when the given name is paired with a middle name like Thi in the example above, this person is most likely female. Um, common second names for males include Kong, Din, Duck, Hu, Nok, Quan, Vin, and Xuan. Upon marriage, women do not take their husband's surname. All right, so now we're gonna move on to Indian naming and Indian naming conventions um, are based on a variety of systems and naming conventions. And th these are gonna vary greatly by region. Um, Indian names are also influenced by religion and caste as well as occupation. Plus there are other influences and a lot of them may be influenced by British and Portuguese naming conventions. Um, religious influences may include some of the following. Um, Sikh names often use Sikh as S-I-K-H -S as the surname or as the suffix to a name. Um, although Sikh is also a clan name and it's not used exclusively by Sikhs. Jains, J-A-I-N, um, often use the surname of Jane, although again, this is not exclusive. Um, most Hindu names consist of a given name, possibly a second name, and a family-based surname. The second name is most probably going to be the father's given name. Indians of the Christian faith follow British naming conventions by and large, while Indians of Muslim faith follow conventions similar to Arabic naming conventions. And we're going to talk about Southern Indian naming. In this example, Kanara Amar Hari. Kanara is the region or village. Amar is the father's given name, and Hari is the given name. Now again, naming conventions are not consistent and they will vary widely by region within Southern India. Um, and this is primarily in the Southern states of Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Kerala. There may not be a surname. Instead, there may be the name of the family's region or the village of origin. Names are often abbreviated except for the given name. So for the example above, the person's name on their documentation may be listed as K.A. Hari instead of Kanara Amar Hari. Women will generally take their husband's surname upon marriage. 
Okay, for Northern India, the example here is Devan Javed Mehta, where Devan is the given name, Javed is the father's given name, Mehta is the surname. Gujarati Hindu people of both sexes will take their father's given name as their second name. So in the example above, Javed is Devan's father's name. Upon marriage, a woman will drop her father's given name and her surname to replace with her husband's given name and surname. For example, if Amaya Barun Shah marries Devan Javad Mehta, her name would change to Amaya Devan Mehta. Hindu naming, um, you'll see usually one of two things, either Daya Nath Singh, where Daya is the given name, Nath is the actual optional second name, and Singh is the surname, or you may see Daya Singh, where the Daya is the given name, Singh is the surname. You may also see Daya Nath, where Daya is the given name and Nath is the optional second name. Um, typically, Hindu names will include a given name and a surname, Second names are optional. If included, the middle name, like in Northern India, uh, is most likely the father's given name. Some Hindu surnames denote castes, and so a person of lower caste may choose to drop his or her surname. If so, the middle name becomes the surname. So for example, Dayanath Singh, dropping the surname would be known simply as Dayanath. Upon marriage, women will take their husband's surname. Now we're moving on to Sikh naming, and we have two different uh, examples, one for a male, Gagan Singh Mali, where Gagan is the given name, Singh is the religious name, Mali is the optional surname. For the female example, Banita Kaur Mali, Banita is the given name, Kaur is the religious name, Mali is the optional surname. So in Sikh naming, the given name is always followed by a religious name, Singh for males or Kaur, K-A-U-R for females. The names Kaur and Singh though are not exclusive to Sikhs and are used throughout India. The Sikh faith opposes caste-based systems and so uh, surnames are not traditionally used. Now we move on to Arabic names. Um, Arabic is the official language for many countries, including Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Qatar, I Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and others. So the naming conventions can vary by region and also by religions practiced. So in Arabic countries, you may see Muslim names, you may see Christian names, Jewish names, etc. Um, we have two different examples as well. The first one is a male example, Bahir bin Fadi bin Sajid al Tikriti, where Bahar, Bahir, bah, Bahir bin is the given name plus bin son of. Fadi bin, Fadi is the father's given name, bin son of. Sajid, the father's given name, al Tikriti, the surname. For a female, Farah bint Fadi bin Sajid al Tikriti, where Farah is her given name, bint means daughter of. Fadi bin, father's given name, plus son of Sajid, the grandfather's given name, Altikriti, the surname. So there are typically um, four components to the name in traditional Arabic names. Some variations can include five or more generations of ancestry and or some of the following components. Religious titles, location of family origin, honored ancestors' names, things like that. Typically, there is only one given name. Some do have compound names, which are typically of religious origin. For example, the prefixes abd, abd, abd al, abd al, or abdul, uh, abdul. This means servant of, uh, combined with the name Allah. So abdallah, abdalala, or abdul Allah. Some Arabic names include names honoring ancestors by using the prefix al or ibn. Arabic surnames will often begin with the prefix al or el, but the prefix may be dropped. Um, Iranian surnames, in addition, will also typically indicate where the family or, uh, originated. Upon marriage, women will keep their surnames. So due to the variations in Arabic alphabet and language, there can be numerous ways to spell a person's name, like we've already talked about Muhammad. Um, to make it more interesting, um, the sample I'm about to show you uh, were names all for the same person, and each document he submitted had something different <laughs> written on it. Um, so this one person can, was called all of the following names. 
Ahmed Hussein, Ahmed Hussein Muhammad, Ahmed bin Hussein bin Muhammad, Abin Hussein ibn Saud al Tikriti, Abin Hussein al Tikriti, Abu Muhammad Ahmed Hussein, and Abu Muhammad. I have to tell you, it was a lot of fun to try to combine those records into one. And he ended up uh, having them combined into Ahmad Hussein Muhammad. Now we move on to South Asian Muslim naming. Um, and we have a few different options. Um, Saeed Bashir Khan, where Saeed is the religious name, which may be more than one name. Bashir, the given name. Um, Khan, the optional surname. And for a female, Rafa Begum Khan, where Rafa is the given name. Begum is an honorific title. Khan is the optional surname. You may also see it formatted as Bashir Saeed Khan, Bashir the given name, Saeed the religious name, Khan the optional surname. And you may also see the female version of Begum Rafa Khan, where Begum is the honorific title, Rafa the given name, Khan the optional surname. Um, traditional Asian Muslim names are determined by the gender, so you should be able to tell uh, once you're used to these names which are typically male, which are typically female. Components of South Asian Muslim male names include one or more religious names, one or more given names, and an optional surname. They may appear in any order. Um, he should be called by his given name and possibly his uh, given name and religious name, but he should never be called by the religious name alone. Components of South Asian Muslim female names include one or more given names, one or more honorific titles, and an optional surname. The honorific titles uh, are typically one of the following, Bibi, Kanam, Begum, which indicates a married woman, Sultana, or Khatun. She should be called by her given name, or by her given name and honorific titles, but also never by the honorific title alone. Some women do not have an honorific title and are given two given names instead. Um, and upon marriage, women do not adopt their husband's name. Now we move on to Russian. Um, we have an example for a male, Vladimir Mikhailovich Borisov, where Vladimir is the given name, Mikhailovich is the father's name plus a suffix, um, and Borisov is the surname. Um, in the female example, Anna Ivanova Borisova. Anna is the given name. Ivanova is the father's name plus the, the feminine uh, suffix. Borisova is her uh, surname. So Russian names consist of the given name, the father's name, and either a masculine suffix for males or a feminine suffix for females, and a surname. Um, Russian middle names will combine the father's name with the suffix Ovich, Avich, Yevich, all meaning son of. Um, or uh, for females, they will use typically Ovna, Evna, Yeva, Ina, all the examples that you see in the table on the screen um, for females. Russian women will retain their given and father's names, but often will change their surname to their husband's surname with the feminine ending when they get married. So although a man and woman may be married and share the same surname, the woman's surname will vary slightly from her husband's. In most cases, the letter A is added to the husband's surname to create the feminine ending. For example, if our sample female here, Anna Ivanova Borisova, marries Boris Petrovich Gudunov, her name would change to Anna Ivanova Gudovna. Now on to Polish names. Again, we have two examples. Alexei Kowalski, uh, where Alexei is the given name, Kowalski is the surname. Mika Kowalska for a female, where Mika is the given name and Kowalska is the surname. So Polish names uh, consist of a given name and a surname. Uh, second names are not common. Many, but not all, Polish surnames will have a feminine ending similar to, to Russian surnames. Um, most of the time, the letter A is added to the surname to create the feminine ending. An exception to this uh, is a name that ends with the suffix witz, W-I-C-Z, for which there is no gender indicative ending. So the name would remain like, uh, 
Wallowitz, it would remain Wallowitz for a female. Upon marriage, women take their husband's surname and they will add the feminine ending depending on the surname. Um, and a word about the letters V and W. There is no letter V in the Polish alphabet. Instead, the letter V sound is made with a letter W. So whereas we might pronounce Alexei and Micah's last name as Kowalski, it would actually be pronounced Kowalski uh, in Polish. Now moving on to the continent of Africa. Naming practices vary greatly based on religion, tribal and ethnic group, and region. And depending on the country, you may see Christian and Muslim naming practices in use in addition to tribal and ethnic uh, influences. So I'm gonna be focusing on Nigeria since the bulk of our African applicants tend to be from Nigeria and I'm more familiar with these. Um, so there are three different groups um, primarily in Nigeria, although, although they have hundreds of different ethnic groups. Um, many with unique naming practices, but the most prominent and the ones that we see most often typically belong to Yoruba, the Igbo, Igbo, uh, or Hausa tribes. Um, the Yoruba tend to live in the southwestern region. And in this example, Oluwole Kuti, where Oluwole is the given name, Kuti is the surname. Um, Yoruba names, given names, are chosen for their meaning and they may actually give information about their holders. Um, they are sometimes chosen to reflect the circumstances under which a child is born. Um, for example, with twins, um, often the firstborn twin has a name indicating, you know, first entry. The, the second twin has a name indicating later. Um, it may describe the day of their birth, such as Sunday, Friday, um, or it may express the parents' hopes for the future. Um, one of my favorite examples is uh, of a family who couldn't have children for several years and finally they were blessed with a child later in life and they named the child Patience because their patience was rewarded. And I just thought that was very sweet. Um, many Yoruba names are, comp are, are compound words um, with the following elements frequently occurring in some part of the name. Ade, Ayo, Fe, Ife, Ire, Oba, Omo, Ola, Olu, or Ulu, uh, Oluwa. Um, and long Yoruba names um, are often abbreviated. For example, uh, Oluwole is a common name. Um, you may actually just see documentation that says Wole, because uh, Wole is a common um, abbreviation for the name Oluwole. Um, individuals may also have a Western nickname or an additional West, Western personal name. These are quite often biblical names like Joseph, Samson, Moses, but they can really be any other Western names like Austin. Um, an example that we had was Austin Babatunde Ola Legben, um, where Austin is his uh, Western name, but his given name was Babatunde. Upon marriage, women will take their husband's surname. Moving on to the Igbo, Igbo uh, naming conventions. Um, in this example, Chinua Achebe. Chinua is the given name, Achebe is the surname. Uh, the Igbo tend to live in the southeastern regions. Many Igbo names are compound words and they frequently use the following elements. Amaka, M, Ma, uh, Enma, Chi, Chukwu, Na, Ne, Enwa, Nu, Ek, or Olisa. Like Yoruba names, long Igbo names are often abbreviated. However, the names are often built from common elements. The same abbreviation may be used for several full names. For example, the abbreviation Emeka, E-M-E-K-A, could be short for Na Emeka, Chi Emeka, Chukwu Emeka, Olisa Emeka, etc. Um, so sometimes that's a help to you and sometimes it's not. Um, Individuals, again, may also have a Western nickname or an additional personal name with a Western influence. And again, these are biblical names, um, but can be any other Western names. So an example that we had um, was Chukwu Moses Chinedu, uh, where Chukwuma is the given name, Moses is the Western uh, biblical uh, second name, and Chinedu is the, the surname. Finally, we'll move on to uh, Hausa naming conventions. In this example, Abu Bakr Kano. Abu Bakr is the given name. 
Kano is the surname. Um, the Hausa inhabit the northern regions of Nigeria. Hausa names are heavily influenced by Islam. For example, the personal name Ahmad, um, and many compound personal names begin with Abdul, meaning servant of, followed by one of the attributes of Allah. For example, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Salam, Abdul Malik, Abdul Aziz, etc. Um, Hausa names may also include the title Al Haji or Haji to indicate the person has undergone the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. Family names may be compounded. Um, so you may see something like Baba Dash Ina. And some family names also come from the local communities like Kano, Sokoto, to show their clan affiliation. So now that you know a little bit about the naming conventions, um, is it possible for you to be able to determine the passport, uh, you, determine the name using the passport? Yes, the answer is yes. This is a sample of the a passport, a machine readable passport. Um, most of the passports you should see now should all be in this new format. Um, foreign visitors to the US, as you can tell, uh, often face many challenges regarding their names, including the following. Um, their names are often misspelled or mispronounced. The accent marks, tildes, umlauts are often lost in translation or transcription. The order of the names may be completely reversed from what we're used to seeing. Many change the order of their names to conform with American naming conventions, and then many of them also adopt American nicknames. So requesting the passport is a way for you to be able to identify their legal name quickly. Um, at Texas Tech University Graduate School, we make the passport bio page an optional requirement since not every applicant will have a passport at the time that they apply. If they cannot provide the passport bio page, we ask them to format their names on the application um, as it appears on legal documents like a birth certificate or a national identity card. But here, you can see in this example from the country of Utopia, uh, the person's surname is Erickson and her given name is Anna Maria. You can also see that down here. Um, the first three letters here, Uto, are her country code, then her name Erickson. This double uh, mark here indicates that this is a break between the names. Um, Anna, one of these, Maria, indicates that these are a compound given name. So you can use that to help you determine what their name should actually be, either in your SEVIS uh, records or in um, your database if you're uh, admissions or study abroad. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to email me. My email address for work is shelby.l.kearley at ttu.edu, or you're also welcome to email me at shelbykearley at gmail.com. Uh, a handout from today's session is going to be available on my blog, which is shelbykearley.wordpress.com. That's S-H-E-L-B-Y-C-E-A-R-L-E-Y.wordpress.com. This video will also be available uh, for you to view on YouTube. Uh, thank you so much for your interest and for your attention, and I look forward to, to visiting with you again in the future soon. Thank you.